the past 4 billion years, our planet Earth has gone through numerous changes, physically and chemically, to get to where we are today, sitting in front of our screens and talking to you. What drives us here, our entire existence? Through mineral and fossil records, we get a picture of how minerals were formed throughout the geologic timeline and how life arose, depended, and shaped Earth's mineral diversity and chemistry. A while ago, Robert Hazen and his team came up with a chronological categorization that helps us understand the mineralogical processes on Earth, which led us here today. The mineral evolution hypothesis posits that the mineralogy of terrestrial planets and moons evolves as a consequence of varied physical, chemical, and biological processes that led to the formation of new mineral species. On Earth, the mineral evolution includes several stages. The first stage being the formation of primary chondrite minerals, which occurred in the stellar nebula prior to planetary accretion. We found approximately 16 different, 60 different minerals in these chondritic materials, which represent the starting point of the mineral evolution of all planets and moons in our solar system. Stage two consists of subsequent aqueous and thermal alteration of chondrites and planetesimal differentiation. The formation of achondrites from partial melting of the chondrites led to the formation of approximately 260 minerals found in unweathered lunar and meteorite samples. Stage three to five marks the process of planetary differentiation. These processes include things like volcanism and degassing, plate tectonics, and associated large-scale fluid rock interactions. In these stages, Earth's first extensive terrains of granite has formed from partially melted wet basalt and were the ignition to continent formation, forming the cores of Earth's continents. These early stages led to the great global scale of plate tectonics, which gave way for the formation of hydrothermal ore deposits, metamorphic terrains, and the appearance of high pressure minerals at Earth's surface. At this point, Earth's mineral diversity increased to approximately 1,500 species. When the agnostic biosphere arose during the Archean Eon, microbial life began to affect Earth's surface mineralogy. Precambrian banded iron formations, the earliest type of sedimentary rocks, were formed, which still represent a major economic source of iron ore presently. These large scale mineral deposits were precipitated oh. under the influences of changing atmospheric and ocean chemistry, which makes way for the era of biologically mediated mineralogy. The Paleoproterozoic Great Oxidation Event and subsequent Neoproterozoic increase in atmospheric oxygen irreversibly transform Earth's near-surface mineralogy and ocean chemistry. More than 2,000 new oxide or hydroxide species, especially ore minerals, were formed. Indications of robust microbial carbonate and phosphate biomineralization were observed in carbonate depositions. By the beginning of the Phenerozoic Eon, biological elements began to selectively uptake elements from the local environment and incorporate them into functional structures under strict biological control. Consequently, Earth's mineral diversity increased again. And thanks to that, the, earlier Cam the early Cambrian saw a rise of all major skeletal minerals responsible for the formations of teeth, shells, and bones. Today, more than 4,300 mineral species have been classified and the geochemical cycles of all most elements are still affected by biology. We now have a clearer picture of Earth's mineral evolution and how those processes might be the key driving forces of life. How does this tie into life detection outside of Earth then? So we wanna understand the mechanisms of mineral evolution that happened here on Earth and relate that to other terrestrial bodies. These general principles on Earth apply equally to any differentiated moon, asteroid, and terrestrial planet. And we can try to compare the surface mineralogy of a planet or moon with the ones on Earth through quantitative measures by using probes, spectroscopes, and more to help us judge whether a terrestrial body is a good candidate for the search of life. One of the best examples is Saturn's icy moon, Enceladus. Enceladus ocean consists of an alkaline chemistry from serpentinization. 
This happens when a rock that is rich in magnesium and iron is converted to clay type minerals. A similar process on Earth can be observed in very limited locations. For example, the lost city in the Atlantic Ocean, which also contains similar hydrothermal vent-like structures that support microbial life. This process produces hydrogen gas, a potent fuel that can drive the formation of organic molecules in, that in some cases can be the building blocks of life. There are also detected compounds containing carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen within Enceladus plumes from the NASA Cassini mission that we know are pre the precursors of life on Earth. Of course, whether the mineralogy in Enceladus is similar to Earth's mineralogy, we don't know yet. And perhaps in the future, we could study Enceladus mineralogy to help us answer more questions about whether Enceladus would be a good candidate for the search of life. But there's a catch. Recently proposed by David Beamer and Bruce Dammer, the hot spring hypothesis seems to imply deep sea oceans with hydrothermal vents may not produce the optimum conditions for life to thrive. And that hot springs on land might be the better option. The key arguments, wet dry cycles in hot springs provide better conditions for condensation reactions, plus, the conditions in oceans are too wet for condensation reactions to be favorable. They also argued that the oceans are too vast, which would dilute the molecules that are precursors to life, meaning that the molecules significant to life formation are not concentrated enough in oceans to drive these chemical reactions. Say, so if this hypothesis turns out to be true on Earth, will Enceladus then be ruled out as a good candidate for life detection? For one, icy moons may also promote condensation reactions. The freezing and thawing of ice may produce wet dry cycles for life. Even then, we should look for any environment in the solar system that might be able to promote these conditions of dehydration. Needless to say, I think Enceladus and other icy moons in our solar system should not be ruled out just yet. We are coming to the end of our presentation, but before that, there is one more thing I want to address. That is the question of synthetic crystalline substances created by us humans. The definition of mineral states that it must be naturally occurring, meaning a mineral should only be classified as one if it was formed naturally and not synthetically by us humans. Even though technically these crystallines are chemically and atomically consistent with other naturally occurring minerals. Intelligent life on Earth may create synthetic crystalline substances, and perhaps alien life would. So does this warrant a new stage of the mineral evolution on Earth? Humans are part of the biosphere that has affected Earth's climate, so maybe it should. Perhaps we could even utilize synthetic crystallines as a biosignature to infer if there are other intelligent worlds out there. This might seem far-fetched, but it would certainly be a great start to add a new era to the mineral evolution on Earth. Oops. Oh, you're, you're muted, Eileen. You need to unmute your mic. There you go. Oh, sorry. My slides were... <laughs> okay, so. Last but not least, before I end this presentation, I want to end with some concluding remarks. That is, the mineral evolution on Earth helps us understand the mineralogical processes on Earth. And by comparing that to other planets in our solar system, it helps us judge which planet or moon is a good candidate for the search of life. And one of the greatest examples in our solar system is Enceladus because it resembles Earth's hydrothermal vent system. And of course, the new stage of the mineral evolution, I think we should add a new era of the mineral evolution called the era of intelligent life, which would perhaps help us find alien worlds and intelligent worlds in the future.
that's it for my talk. Thank you. Yay. Um, awesome, Eileen. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions, maybe. I do want to remind everyone, we'll also be taking conversations to the Blue Psycon channel in Slack um, so that we're not taking over the chat space here uh, during other talks. One, ta one question that came in from Jacob Hak Misra is, why would intelligent life be considered a non-natural way of synthesizing minerals? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, that's a question that I think about it, too, because... Um, the definition is not up updated yet, and the definition, the actual definition of minerals is actually, um, it must be naturally occurring. So, for humans, we, we don't consider that natural. We, we consider that as synthetic, um, the ones that we created our own. So, yeah, that's that's a good question. That's what I thought too. And you know, that's why I think we should add a new um, era in for the uh, mineral evolution. 